Welcome, Olga, and thank you for joining us. We'll be starting in two minutes. With pleasure. I'm waiting. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so it's just gone 3 p.m. CET and 2 p.m. here in Dublin and in London. So uh, without any further to do, well, hello everybody and welcome to the inaugural Converse EU event. Today, this session is with our series program 2020 and it features a discussion on COVID-19, challenges and opportunities. And during the Q&A session, we've received a number of questions already for the panel. And if we have time, we'd like to take a few audience questions. So please send your question in the chat to Converse EU. And hopefully we'll have some time to at least to take some of them at the end. Make sure your microphones are on mute before we start. And just to minimize the disruption to the uh, guest speakers, also can you switch off your videos as well until such time as you're, you, are, uh, you are speaking. So that's the, the audience, the panelists will leave their videos on. Um, okay, so we have a, an esteemed collection. I'm very, very thankful to have this uh, panel together uh, for our inaugural session. Um, so Pim Valre from, um, from the World Economic Forum, uh, Sylvia Vaccaro from DG Grohl, Lorenzo Giacchia from, the, from uh, the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, Louise de Mella, who's Director of Economics of OECD, and Ricardo Borges de Castro, de Castro who is a GCSB at the moment. And um, I'm delighted that they were all able to make some time um, for us uh, today with a very exciting uh, panel of um, experts. Um, this is going to be what the the uh, um, the running order will look like uh, for the next hour or so. Um, and uh, at the very outset, we have, and I'm pleased to announce that we have uh, Olga uh, Algeirova, um, who is the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe's Executive Secretary, and she's going to say a few words uh, to open the event. So hopefully, Olga, you can hear me okay and are not muted. And so it's over uh, to you now. Thank you, dear Ray, dear colleagues, dear friends. It's my great pleasure to be here and uh, I'm very much looking forward to your discussion on how Europe can move forward in the time of COVID-19. This pandemic has devastated economies. A huge rebuilding efforts will be necessary when it's done. The UN Secretary General has identified this is an opportunity to create more sustainable, resilient and inclusive societies. We don't have to go back to our old habits. The SDGs adopted by UN member states in 2015 are a great achievement with a forward-looking perspective. They offer us direction on how to redress challenges or prevent certain unwelcome developments Currently, we have the decade of action to accelerate implementation. We can seize this opportunity provided by the recovery from COVID-19 and align rebuilding efforts with the 
SDGs to build back better. So let us rethink, reconnect and rebuild together. Helping countries to rebuild after crisis is something which UNEC has experience with. UNEC was founded in the wake of uh, Second World War with a goal to promote economic cooperation and integration among the world economies of the pan-European region for over 70 years. And even during the height of the Cold War, we have been bringing the East and the West in our region together to collaborate peacefully on technical norms and standards. We work in several fields such as transport, trade facilitation, statistics, environment, housing, etc. This mandate remains as relevant as ever in the face of the current recession and the need for subsequent rebuilding in alignment with the SDGs. Governments are now issuing directives to many different sectors and they reopen for business. I hope they use this opportunity to encourage the discontinuation of old harmful habits and enact stronger policies and incentives. These SDGs provide an excellent foundation. Why? They facilitate connectivity, address transboundary and other risks, support a green and resilient recovery, and I would like to stress here the word resilient. Implementing the SDGs indeed means that we will be better prepared to respond to and recover from future crises. How? Let me give you some examples from the work of UNEC. As one of the five regional commissions of the United Nations, we provide a political platform to develop joint responses in a multilateral context based on broad, multidisciplinary technical expertise. Our work is demand-driven and responsive to emerging trends. Through the collaboration of our 56 member states and often even the larger UN family, it is more far-reaching and impactful than individual action. Moreover, we can offer a number of instruments that are already a meaningful response framework to certain aspects of the COVID recovery. We have a classification system for sustainable resource management called UNFC in short. It applies to oil and gas, renewable energy, nuclear fuels, minerals and others, and reduces carbon footprint by optimizing their management. It also applies to secondary resources that thus helping the circular economy. UNFC supports several SDGs, such as SDG 7 on clean energy, SDG 10 on infrastructure, SDG 13 on climate action, etc. The EU notably uses UNFC to manage the critical raw material needs for batteries and financially supports our work. But UNFC is also relevant in the context, the COVID context. Hospitals had shortages of critical medications, such as anesthesians, and European manufacturing is hampered by the dependence on imports of active ingredients from China and India. Applying UNFC can secure the supply chains for these raw materials used in the pharmaceutical industries. This is also relevant to mass scale vaccine development. This is but one example of how harmonized technical norms and standards can help countries implement the SDGs while also recovering from the pandemic. My dear colleague, Lorenza Jackia will provide you with more examples as well. Once again, in concluding, I invite all actors to focus on the SDGs in the context of moving forward after the pandemic. Thank you so much for your attention. Back to Thank you. you very much, Olga, for that uh, that very uh, concise and interesting introduction to to our talk today. Um, next up, it will be my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Pim Valdre. Um, Pim is a, a policy expert and um, with political affairs uh, experience from the United Nations, from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Sweden, International Peace Institute, in New York. Uh, Pim was an executive in the executive office of the United Nations Secretary General and in, in the office of the President of the United Nations General Assembly, amongst other advisory roles. 
uh, Pimmons and MA and BA from Uppsala University and Institute de Tout de Sciences Politiques. Her main role in the World Economic Forum is lead on regional and geopolitical affairs. Uh, welcome, Pim. Can you provide some uh, context from World Economic Forum on your current European situation with respect to COVID-19 pandemic? You're on mute, Pim, just one second. Oh, there we go. Okay, there we go. So hi, everyone from Geneva. And um, here at the World Economic Forum, we're currently very much focused on how we Sorry, it does not seem to work. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now, Pim. Sorry, yes, must have got muted there for a second, okay? Okay, so I'll start again. Well, hi everyone from Geneva. Um, well, from the World Economic Forum, we're looking really, really at how we can use this crisis as an opportunity to develop a new economic growth model for Europe, and also how we can mobilize business and industry and in really generating this shift towards a more Paris aligned and sustainable future. I think we've all seen over the past uh, months and weeks um, the size of unprecedented fiscal stimulus coming from both European institutions and governments. Uh, I mean, looking at Spain and Italy, for instance, so far spending more than 7 and 5% of the GDP, and Germany and Sweden topping with 10 and about 12%. And I think it's important to, to realize that uh, this fiscal stimulus is going to shape our economies and societies for generations to come. So to, froze, to quote uh, Franz Timmermans that we had on a call here uh, a few days ago, we, we really only get one shot at spending this money right. And we really must use this stimulus uh, wisely uh, and really not inject it into old and obsolete 20th century fossil dependent models, but towards generating a system shift and a new economic model based on low emission industries, green infrastructure and circular economy. So we're very much looking at how we can help uh, accelerate such a shift. Um, and we really also think that the fact that the Commission has used the European Green Deal as a growth strategy uh, in this narrative for the region uh, has also helped uh, in mobilizing uh, the global community towards this green recovery. And we watched with interest yesterday uh, the launch uh, of the new EU recovery fund on 750 billion, we think that this is truly unprecedented, uh, not only because of the size of the fund, but, but because it also uh, um, aims to make financing instruments and investment consistent with the green transition and our net zero emissions 2050 target. So that leads me to my second point, which is that I really feel that we are uh, facing a test of European solidarity. Uh, obviously, we will only know to what extent these measures and policies that have been laid out uh, in this new EU recovery package, um, if it will have impact um, based on the coming intergovernmental process. Uh, we've seen the deep splits uh, within the bloc uh, with the frugal four um, objecting to the financing model of this package. So obviously, what is really needed right now is for business and industry to essentially support and uh, encourage governments to take their responsibility and to deliver on this very ambitious plan. Uh, and my third point is that I think uh, we also need to leverage the role of capital markets and of the finance system uh, in this recovery. Um, and here, what we need are clearer tools and guidance uh, in order to unlock the role of capital markets. We've seen some progress on this lately with the new non-financial reporting disclosure uh, regulation from the EU. Uh, this directive will help uh, companies and businesses to disclose the impact of their business activities and how it relates to climate change mitigation uh, and other sustainability dimensions. Um, and we've also seen the, the EU's new sustainability taxonomy. And, and this is important because it gives business and industry a sort of a common uh, framework and vocabulary uh, to start realigning their business models uh, towards the Paris Agreement and towards the European Green Deal. 
So, uh, I mean, I think we've often said that Europe is the regulatory superpower, and I think there's a lot we can do here also to leverage this uh, at the global level and to show that Europe is really ready to step up its global leadership role and pave the way uh, for other large economies on how uh, a green and sustainable recovery should look like. So I'm um, very happy to be here and uh, look forward to um, participating in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Pim. Um, now, it's now my extreme pleasure to introduce a, a friend and colleague of mine from UNES, uh, some of our committees where we work together, Lorenza Jackia. And Lorenza is Secretary of the UNES Working Party on Regulatory Cooperation and Standardization for WP6. Um, she works on policy and making of, of regulatory action, um, a big evangelist when it comes to standards for, for the Sustainable Development Goals, and is one of the leads behind Gender Responsive Standards Declaration. And she also is involved in regulations as tools to attain SDG 5, achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls. And uh, amongst other things, uh, she, she has authored several hundred reports and publications for, for uh, UNES. Um, so without any further to do, I will um, hand over to you, Lorenza, uh, so you can um, put the context from UNES's perspective. Thank you so much, Ray, and uh, thank you for this uh, opportunity. I would like to start by placing the current crisis in a broader context. And the first feature that I'd like to focus on is the extreme uncertainty and volatility of the current situation. And I'd like to project a chart, if I may, that uh, gives you a measure of this uh, uncertainty. And this chart, uh, uh, yeah, it's going to come up shortly. Uh, is uh, giving you the World Uncertainty Index, which is constructed by the IMF uh, using the frequency of the word uncertainty in country reports published by the Economist Intelligence Unit. And it captures uncertainty in individual countries, but also around the world. And this indicator has increased tenfold over the last uh, decade. It, um, it shows that uh, the last month of 2019, before the onset of this crisis, had already been characterized by exceptional turbulence on international markets with multiple uh, uh, threats that we all remember. And uh, that then ushered in with 2020, the crisis caused by the novel coronavirus and this uh, difficult and painful crisis that we're living through right now. Second, I'd like to also mention that uh, the current health crisis also plays in the context of Agenda 2030 and our collective efforts to move towards a more sustainable world. Again, uh, as the Executive Secretary mentioned, the current crisis and Agenda 2030 are closely linked. On the one hand, the achievement of the global goals really uh, are critical and, uh, and, and the extent to which we achieved or we didn't achieve or progress uh, on the goals itself uh, was such an important determinant of the impact of the crisis. In, cr in countries where there is a fragile public health system, uh, in which a large part of the population does not have access to sanitation or that have uh, uh, many workers in precarious employment or that are homeless, the impact will be just that much more devastating. On the other hand, of course, the pandemic impacts on the achievement of the goals. It will impact upon the fight against poverty. It will increase the uh, so SDG 1, it will increase the number of people at risk of famine, SDG 2, it will worsen education, uh, education outcomes, it will slow economic growth and employment. It is too early to say what the impact of uh, COVID-19 will be uh, on human development in its different dimensions. But UNDP has, uh, uh, start, uh, has uh, projected this impact and has shown that uh, uh, the indicator for human development is set to drop for the first time when it 
was uh, since when it was introduced in in uh, in the 90s so uh now uh it is uh, in our hands uh what happens next and uh, uh we can uh rewrite uh, a different uh, a different narrative and taking advantage of the stimulus packages and taking advantage of the opportunities that are before it, before us in order to make sure that uh, we rebound from this crisis uh, in a more resilient and a more sustainable uh, development paradigm. Thank you very much, Lorenzo. And apologies, we have a technical error on this side, so this slides detect no the graphic didn't, didn't display. Um, but thank you very much for, for for setting the scene there from from the perspective of UNES. Um, next is it's my pleasure also to introduce uh, Luis de Mello, and Luis is 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 uh, from, with the policy studies teams and provides leadership and strategic direction within the economics department of OECD, and his policies. Uh, there, which promote stronger, cleaner, fair, and more inclusive economic growth. Um, he's did, including some of his senior positions include the Deputy Director of the Public Governance Directorate, Chief of Staff and Counselor to the Chief Economist. And prior to joining OECD, he worked as a Senior Economist at the Fiscal Affairs Department of the International Monetary Fund. Uh, uh, Luis holds a PhD in Economics from the University of Kent, United Kingdom. Without any further ado, Louise, I'll ask you to set the scene um, from OECD's perspective. Thank, thank you very much, Ray. Thanks for the, the opportunity to participate in this uh, conversation. Hello, uh, uh, everyone. Well, the OECD, we've been uh, busy over the last uh, uh, three months, almost like everybody else, I guess. But uh, focusing a lot on taking stock of what uh, countries are doing, the initiatives that they are putting in place to deal with the uh, effects uh, of the crisis, and at the same time providing analysis, providing advice uh, to policymakers in uh, best ways, basically, to, to, uh, to deal with that. Um, I take the opportunity to invite you all to uh, take a look at the, uh, our COVID uh, hub uh, that uh, is available on our website, and there you will find a uh, a selection of uh, thematic notes, uh, um, uh, a stock taking of country experiences and other material that may be of, uh, of help to you, to you all. But I would like to take the opportunity now, uh, Ray, to basically get, get a couple of messages uh, across from the beginning. One is that this crisis, as was highlighted before, is having really a dramatic effect on our economies and, and, and societies. To give you an idea, we did a, a very simple exercise and looked at all the sectors in our economies that are being affected by lockdowns, partial or full, by basically confinement uh, uh, strategies that countries are, are, uh, have laid out. And those sectors account for about 30 or 40% of GDP uh, in the average OECD country. I'm talking about the tourism, entertainment, uh, parts of manufacturing, uh, services, retailing that require uh, direct contact between uh, customers and service providers. So big chunks of our economies are being affected directly uh, by that. Um, and those uh, sectors tend to employ a lot of people. Uh, again, if you look at the very same sectors that are being affected by confinement uh, strategies, uh, they tend to employ on average about 40% uh, um, of, uh, of people uh, in OECD countries uh, as a whole. And a big chunk of those 40% of people, another 40% of the 40% is basically people who have uh, the so-called non-standard uh, forms of work. The self-employed people that don't have fixed term contracts, uh, the self-employed, for instance, so people who are uh, most vulnerable uh, to job losses, uh, people who are basically, uh, if you want, uh, in, in the gaps of social protection systems, so they tend to be a lot more vulnerable than others. If you look at firms, so the very same sectors, uh, if you take the firms that are at greater risk of being illiquid uh, after a while, illiquid in the sense of not having revenue that is high enough to basically uh, 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 cover their operating costs, pay their taxes, and, uh, and, and honor the debt, the debt obligations. That's about 20% uh, uh, in our calculation of firms could be in that situation a month uh, into the crisis. Uh, about 30% could be in the same situation about four, four months into the crisis. So I'm just giving you these very big numbers just to illustrate this asymmetry. It's a crisis that affects activities and sectors very unevenly, workers very unevenly, 
and firms very unevenly. So what's important from now on? I think one, and that's my second message to, to start off with, is that it's very important basically uh, that, um, uh, you know, that we could move on to the support that governments are providing, and they are doing that through a variety of mechanisms that we've all been talking about for a long time. But it's important to move from that phase of support to a phase of recovery, phase of, uh, of, of basically putting in place policies that can facilitate reallocation of resources as our economies are affected in a more long lasting manner by this crisis, uh, to facilitate then the recovery, to facilitate reallocation, and to make sure that then uh, we can move on to a post-crisis phase uh, of strong growth, strong productivity performance, um, uh, and, and better outcomes uh, across a variety uh, of metrics that are important for governments and for societies alike. I think I'll stop here, Ray, and uh, and happy to develop some of those arguments in the Q and A. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thanks very much, uh, Luis. Um, yes, uh, there's there's so much to cover in this, so we're going to try and, and keep it as brief as possible on the intro and give us more time for Q and A at the end because we've we've a stacked load of, of questions already uh, lined up. Uh, it's now my extreme pleasure for another colleague of mine who's another evangelist of, of standardization to introduce Sylvia Vaccaro. And Sylvia has a master's degree in international relations, politics, and trade. Uh, her work in the unit standardization of European Commission at DG Grow it, it means that she runs into me from from time to time on, on, on various committees as well. Um, she's She's part of, of World Trade Organization, TBT, Technological Barriers to Trade, and, and the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe in conjunction with uh, uh, Sylvia and, and uh, sorry, in conjunction with, with uh, Lorenzo and also um, Olga as part of uh, UNES as well. And International Project so CESI, which is a seconded European standardization expert in India, and EAS FPI funded international digital cooperation. So without any further ado, I'll hand over to Sylvia Vaccaro. And Sylvia, you can give, set the scene from the European Commission's and DG Grow's perspective. Yeah. Uh, hello. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, very happy to be here. And I will uh, sort of uh, move down from the, the, very, the various high-level discussion that we had so far. Uh, to focus a little bit more on what uh, uh, the European Commission, especially DigiGrow, is doing, which is uh, uh, basically free movement of goods. And uh, we all know that with, uh, with the COVID-19, the first shock was uh, uh, to the global supply chain. So all of a the sudden, there was uh, an exceptional circumstances that called for exceptional measures. And the first reaction, unfortunately, of many member states was a knee-jerk reaction to close the border, close the free movement of goods, close the free circulation of citizens. And of course, while we could understand, uh, also because the European Commission does not have any competence for uh, health matters, we could not allow that uh, important uh, trade in, uh, in goods, especially because all our economy are very, very interconnected, uh, could be affected by COVID-19. So my department, my, my directorate, uh, worked very hard with the different member states in order to ensure uh, the free movement of goods within the single market. And by creating what we call the green corridors in order to allow uh, priority equipment and devices to flow uh, freely between, uh, between the different countries. Uh, then, uh, of course, we realized that there was a need of having a lot more uh, personal protective equipment and medical devices. So masks, uh, respirators, uh, all sorts of gloves and things like that. So the, the European Commission, again, uh, reached uh, agreements with member states and, um, and produced guidelines in order for, uh, to have safe products still on the single market, but uh, uh, but make it uh, a little bit faster and have the, the goods delivered uh, faster to the, to the end users. Um, last but not least, uh, there was a, a request from the European Commission to the, our European standardizer, so Sensonella Canetzi, to provide free access to those standards that were helping uh, with the manufacturing and the distribution of uh, uh, personal protective equipment and medical devices. So several, uh, several standards were um, made available by the national standards body in the local language 
to all uh, those manufacturers, and luckily there were many, who decided to change a little bit their production in order to uh, answer um, the need of, uh, of having something uh, at, uh, at their disposal. And the last uh, action we did was only last week, was to uh, ask the standardization bodies again uh, to make some sort of uh, quick deliverable on how to prepare the masks that uh, you're gonna have to use when you go to the supermarket, those reusable ones, in order to have products that are not at, of a medical level, of course, but they're still um, giving some protection and uh, has to had to comply with certain uh, with certain rules. So that's something that should be ready by the mid of June, uh, in order to let's say gather all the efforts of the different member states, as there was already something from uh, France, from Spain, uh, from Belgium, uh, to have something that uh, would be uh, available and ready at uh, at European level. So, and that's basically uh, everything for me. And uh, I, I think that we will have a very good discussion later on. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Sylvia. Um, uh, excellent introduction as well um, from the European Commission and DG Growth perspective. Um, well, next up and last but not least is, uh, I want to introduce again another, another of our expert panelists, and this is uh, Ricardo Borges de Castro, a former advisor on strategic foresight to European Political Strategy Centre in the European Commission. Uh, his expertise on global trends and strategic foresight, uh, anticipatory democracy it was the key word that stood out for me there. Uh, EPS as projects leader for the European Strategy and Policy Analysis System, ESPAS, and a member of cabinet to Jose Manuel Barroso, as president of the European Commission, as well as spokesperson for Europe and the world at Commission's Spokespersons Planning and Coordination Unit. Uh, a lot of commission and strategic foresight um, backgrounds available um, and insights coming from um, Ricardo. So without any further ado, Ricardo, over to you for your setting the scene on strategic foresight. Thank you very much, Ray. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm speaking uh, from, from Brussels. Uh, I mean, I think I want to actually take already some of the words and expressions that my predecessors uh, used um, to make my, my introduction because they are, they are in line with what I thought about saying a little bit on you know, the role of foresight in a situation like this. And so far, we have been at the end of the alphabet. We've been on resilience, recovery, volatility, response, um, uncertainty, and, and I want to move a little bit to the to the to the start of the of the alphabet, to so anticipation. And I think when we start looking at this crisis, um, of course, we are in this situation because some you know some of the of the systems that we normally have to to prevent this uh, this from happening maybe have failed. And I would say that very clearly, I don't think that this has been a failure of foresight per se, it has been rather more a failure, I think, initially of transparency, also of preparedness, but also of competence. Because, I mean, when you look at, let's say, at the, at the global health uh, security index, you see that there are countries that have a high, very high rating in terms of preparedness, and, you know, the competence that they've had in dealing with this situation has not been, uh, I mean, it has not been at least, it does not correspond to the, to the scores that these countries have. Of course, I mean, the, the pandemic has affected countries differently because of demographic compositions, the moment when, uh, you know, decisions to lockdown were made, uh, previous experience on dealing with these issues. So there are many, I mean, many, many factors that, uh, that, that, that play into this and we should not undermine. But foresight, in my view, is very much a call to action and should lead to preparedness. And so clearly there is, I mean, if we can already start taking some of the lessons from, from, from this situation, if we want to actually make sure that we are able to be better at anticipating, we need to be better also at, at making the link between foresight and foresight reports. I mean, it was known that a pandemic would happen. I mean, many foresight reports have pointed to this. We just didn't know when they would happen. And so... Uh, what it means is that the needs to be able to be better at translating uh, insights from foresight work uh, to policy making, I think we need to, I think uh, we need to, uh, to do this better. But as I was saying, I mean, foresight is very much about building up, it's about action, it's about shaping the future. And my, you know, my predecessors also mentioned already several of the tools that we will need to use to get out of the, of the, of the current situation. 
And of course, um, as Lorenzo was saying, I mean, there's deep uncertainty you know, and some of the uncertainty that we are living now is only being accelerated by the crisis because it was already coming, uh, it was already coming from before. So what foresight can also help us do at this stage? I think if anyone or anyone that works in the field will come and tell you, this is how the future is going to look like, don't believe them. You know, her or him or her are lying. I mean, they, no one actually knows. What we can do and how we can help organizations, governments, and, and you know, all of us are trying to think what is the best way forward is basically to try to start making sense uh, of what of the situation, looking at trying to interpret certain you know weak signals that might have an impact in shaping these uncertainties and trying to understand what these uncertainties might be. I wanted to just to focus now on a very concrete point because I think it's very relevant that normally I don't see so much discussed um, in in, um, in in this in this I mean in this fora and uh, when we are talking about also foresight and some of the of the of the, let's say of the of the commodities are very important and I think this crisis is very different from previous crises because it's about life and death so people are fearful. And I think, you know, we can pour tons of money into the economy, we can do all of these things, but if we don't have the people coming along, if people don't trust, you know, the leadership, and if people don't trust the competence and the ability of states and organizations to actually deliver a future that necessarily should be better, should go in the, in the direction that both Luis, Pim, uh, um, uh, Silvia have pointed out, I think, you know, we will not be able to, to master this and we'll add uncertainty to, to this because, I mean, trust is very much also about uncertainty and, about, and fear is also about uncertainty. So we need to help also citizens and, you know, all of us because, I mean, maybe all of us are a little bit fearful about this. So I think this element, you know, mastering the issue of trust and fear is going to be key to, to, to exit this, uh, this crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ricardo. Uh, and, and, and that aspect of, of trust like brings us straight into the Q and A and and the fact that many vulnerable workers and and I think Louise maybe have a, has a view of this are at a great risk of losing their jobs and many small firms risk becoming insolvent. So Louise, what would you what can be done? Right, Ray. This is this is a, I think a, one of the central um, challenges here for policy. You know, uh, there is a lot that governments are doing now to help firms and workers during during the, the the height of the crisis if you want uh, lots of schemes that involve tax deferrals that involve uh, income replacement programs uh, to support the self-employed improvements in access to social security uh, to social protection really is sick leave and employment benefits for those non-standard uh, uh, workers if you want uh, there is a lot that is happening in the housing market for instance all sorts of loan and tax uh, uh, forbearance mechanisms that are making it easier for people to to go through the, the, the this um, you know most most dramatic uh, uh, period of the crisis. I think the issue that is important it ties in I think well with what Ricardo mentioned. That is as we move on towards the recovery, uh, people will feel more confident that they can go out that, that the situation is under control. Uh, that is not something that we usually take into account very easily in our models because we don't know how much pent up demand that there will be. You know, if people feel confident and start going out and shopping, restaurants open, you know, that will come with a big boost to the economy, but we just don't know what the size of that will, will be. On the other hand, if that lack of confidence lingers, if there is uncertainty as to the outcome or the outlook for this pandemic, uh, then there may be more precautionary savings and that has an impact again, on, on the macroeconomy, if you want. But I think the, the key message, and if I can go back to the, to the context that we all set out, I think, uh, in our different uh, interventions, is that what is it that needs to be done now that will put our economies and societies on a better footing uh, to basically withstand this period, this transition, and come out of it uh, you know, uh, better? Uh, let's not forget, before we came into this crisis, our economies and societies were already facing uh, challenges and headwinds related to population aging, so adverse demographics, the climate issue, um, slow productivity growth. So what is driving you know, growth down, the performance of our economies down over the longer terms has to do with this, productivity is low. So we cannot afford to come out of this crisis with another big shock to productivity. So making sure that our performance, that whatever we do now uh, has an eye on what can make our economies better, workers better placed uh, uh, to move to jobs uh, and sectors where economic prospects are better, that companies can restructure their activities better so that we don't end up in a situation that we did 
10 years ago with the global crisis, stranded assets, um, long-term unemployed, uh, lack of reallocation, if you want me to use a more technical term about it. Uh, that I think is uh, the challenge that we all uh, that we're all facing right now. And can I put that then? I mean, the, the fact that we need to go to the next phase and and looking at green recovery and and, and Pim, I'm sure will have a view on this and and the 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 EU recovery plan, which is which is front and center at the moment. We've heard a lot about hydrogen lately as one of these key levers in energy transition. Pim, do you want to add, take that point up? Sure. And just to also second what Louise uh, just talked about, I think it's really key uh, in this recovery that we demonstrate to the citizens that we can really create high quality jobs that have a chance of withstanding future shocks. Uh, and actually on that note, um, it's also interesting to look at what evidence we have to look at what stimulus actually works and what, what stimulus actually leads to, um, to, to competitive economies and, and job growth. And I don't know if you've seen the recent uh, study uh, at Oxford University by Nicholas Stern and Joseph Stieglitz uh, and a few other economists, they actually analyzed um, uh, green stimulus versus regular stimulus in the 2008-2009 uh, uh, financial crisis. Uh, and they actually found that uh, green stimulus measures uh, produced more jobs that delivered uh, higher short-term returns um, to the government and it also led to increase, increased uh, long-term cost savings. So um, it's very encouraging to see that this new EU recovery fund puts a lot of emphasis on, for instance, huge infrastructure uh, renovations uh, and investment in green buildings that will lead to, to good uh, uh, and green jobs. Uh, just quickly on hydrogen, yes, uh, definitely this is a key to the energy transition. We've seen it uh, coming back in the industrial strategy. Uh, it also comes back in the, in the current EU recovery uh, fund uh, that was introduced yesterday. Obviously, wind and solar will continue to play a major role uh, in decarbonizing the economy because they have become the cheapest source of electricity, which is also a second effect of uh, a lot of the stimulus that was put in 2008, 2009, not to mention in, in the US. Um, but if you look at the heavy duty sectors such as steel, chemicals, uh, heavy duty transport, uh, then these wind and solar power, well, electricity is too expensive or it's too, too difficult to electrify. So, uh, so the short answer is that yes, hydrogen will play a major role uh, in decarbonization. Yeah, and, and, and when we're talking about this recovery and, for, and the European uh, Commission perspective with, with, with Sylvia being in DG, DG Grow, um, what did the European Commission do, for example, to, to, to face this crisis and, and what can we learn for the future? Yes, well, um, I think that the European Commission has been in the news quite a lot lately on uh, about the, the huge recovery package that was uh, presented yesterday. Uh, of course, this has to be uh, still approved by, by the Parliament and especially by the Council, so we will see what that leads to. But as far as my DG is concerned, I'm, uh, I must admit that the, the um, the reaction of the European Commission in general, in general, at the beginning was quite slow. But then, once the the depth and the and the gravity of the situation was actually understood, uh, we all sprang into action, and we actually worked very hard in the first couple of weeks to ensure that the goods were circulating freely, that uh, there would be some sort of depository of medical devices and uh, and personal protective equipment at European level. And, uh, and that uh, all, all the things that needed to be done and the, the goods were circulating freely. And also now with uh, everyone asking themselves if there will be a summer, if we can go to Spain, if we can go to France. Um, also there, the European uh, Commission is working very hard with member states in order not to have uh, a pick and choose uh, depending on the tourist nationality but uh, having something at, uh, at European level that would, uh, that would make sense. So I would say that um, even though there was a slow start, the European Commission definitely uh, picked up and cleaned their work afterwards. Thanks very much, Sylvia. And I think that leads on to maybe looking at the, the United Nations perspective on this as well. And, and uh, I'll, I'll maybe bring the next one to Lorenzo. Uh, the, the pandemic has shown weaknesses and also strengths in emergency preparedness. Uh, what can we learn? And are there practical ways for policymakers and businesses to, to manage different kinds of risks with, with 
transparency and accountability, like um, you'd have the experience of this from, from a, a UNES perspective. Ray and uh, indeed I'm connecting back to what uh, Ricardo and then other speakers were saying today, uh, that emergency preparedness is key because there will be more crises, there will be more, uh, more, more contingencies that we have not predicted. Uh, on a positive note, I think every manager can say without a doubt that we were amazed by our staff resilience, by our staff adaptability. And in UNECE, it was just amazing. Like, and, and I can say the same of many organizations that I'm closely working with. We switched to home working without, without delay. We really sprang into action. We really, I think we, we should congratulate ourselves for what we've done collectively. And um, it, it has meant a major transformation, but we were able to continue to work while our offices were closed. And looking uh, at uh, these responses, I can say that those organizations that were most successful had a little bit of a secret weapon in terms of uh, use of standardization, use of guidelines. And uh, uh, there are a number of these voluntary standards that are available and in particular right now they're even freely available on the websites of the standards organizations uh, that have made them uh, uh, available to us during this uh, this acute crisis and whether uh, we we use those standards explicitly like that they are certified or we use them implicitly in preparing our organization's guidelines for responding to crisis uh, there's no doubt that uh, it creates certainty, it creates predictability, it creates, it contributes to create trust as well with our uh, with our stakeholders that business will continue. And uh, uh, we at UNEC have uh, since 2012 hosted a unique group of experts that develops best practice for uh, public administrations on how to manage public risks. And we have taken this uh, best practice really from standards like uh, standards uh, ISO 31000, for example, and others. And uh, there is one recommendation uh, among those that have been developed by this group that really uh, comes to mind uh, right now. And it is about crisis management within regulatory frameworks. And uh, we look at that and, and it says that uh, regulatory authorities should design crisis management functions as part of any regulatory framework. So not just to have a separate uh, authority that looks at all emergencies, but to have in each and every regulatory framework, say education, for example, uh, a specific clause about crisis. So that when a crisis hit, uh, each and every sector is impacted and each and every sector has the resources to, to spring back. And I think that's something that we should really um, embed into our response to, to the crisis, into the stimulus packages, to embed this uh, ability to, to spring back and to, and, and to be more resilient. Thanks, Lorenzo. Actually, and that just, I suppose, uh, hindsight is probably 2020 in terms of what we've learned from, from this already. But Ricardo, maybe with your expertise, can strategic foresight for example, help organizations uh, charter this post-pandemic world? I mean, I think definitely. I think, I mean, to, to a certain extent, you know, we are more prepared now for the next pandemic, right? So we need to start thinking, I mean, what are the other things that we might need to, 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 to sort of to be facing or that we are likely to, to face uh, in going forward? I think, I mean, there, I think there's, um, there's an issue not only of, of institutional design, and for example, I can give the example of the European Commission, which is the one that I know best, that now is a vice president for foresight. So, I mean, the Commission and the EU are trying to upgrade their anticipatory systems to be able to be better at, uh, at, addressing, at addressing these issues. But it is not only about a unit or, or institutional design, it's also about mindset. It's also about preparing society, because as Lorenz again said, I mean, this, this is going to continue. I mean, this type of shocks, you know, this type of, of crisis, they will continue. And, and I think what we need also to have is the ability that people are a little bit more resilient also to deal with uncertainty. I mean, the future is always uncertain. 
And so I think one of the, the ways that, I mean, foresighters are used is precisely because we can, we you know, manage, you know, volatility or, or uncertainty. We are comfortable with this because this is basically where we thrive. It's where we try to find, you know, tell our, tell our stories about the future and try to help decision makers think about the future and think about issues that, uh, that, uh, that might, be, might be coming at them. I think you know the lessons that 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 we learn uh, from this this crisis will be very very relevant because only knowing where we stand can we actually then start building future. And for example, I mean, Sylvia mentioned the, the issue, and this is more sort of an European discussion that I think we might need to have in the future. That I mean, the EU does not have competences on health, and but maybe shouldn't we have the discussion? Shouldn't we have it? And uh, I mean, and the, a poll released yesterday by the European Parliament clearly shows that Europeans want the EU to have more. But I mean, that's also one more competences on health, okay, that's normal. I mean, Europeans, once there is a crisis, they always want more competences in where things might have not worked well. But we really need to think through, you know, what might be the competences of the EU in going forward, what type of organization we want to be in the future. And I mean, in 2017, we launched this paper on the, on the, on the future of Europe with five scenarios where, you know, there was even a discussion, should we stop doing some things and start doing others or just, you know, focus on some of them to be really, really, really effective. I think we need to have uh, this discussion in going forward. And I think, you know, foresight, people that work in the, you know, strategic planning can help also policymakers doing this because as I understand now, everybody's focused on the current crisis, but I mean, there needs to be a group of people thinking already what's gonna come next because we don't wanna be caught again in a situation as we are uh, with all the consequences that's, that are very, you know, visible to, to all of us, even in our personal lives. Yes. In what, yeah. Exactly, Ricardo. I mean, and 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 uh, um, Lorenzo made a point. Like, I mean, we, we reacted very well in terms of telework, teleworking, and that aspect uh, of, of the the, the tr transition to cope with the with the COVID nineteen pandemic. Um, but but another way, uh, maybe I could ask this one of, of Louise. Like, I mean, uh, when, uh, in relation to teleworking, maybe as case in point and and digital transformation, the crisis can be a catalyst. For further digital transformations, we've been thrown into this uh, maybe a more accelerated digital transformation. What would your view on that be, Luis? Yeah, absolutely, uh, Ray. I, I think it is really an opportunity here to advance some of the the the, the phenomena that are already taking place. Right, you mentioned the case of teleworking. I think it's uh, it, it, it's it's going to be part of the new normal that people will telework, people who can will telework more. Uh, but also it's a huge opportunity for also for governments to invest more in their digital transformation. No, we are seeing that still uh, some of the, in many countries, uh, uh, it's still a fraction of society that interacts with government through digital means, not only to find information online, that in a way I would say it's the easy part of the problem, but to interact genuinely, to basically seek services, uh, share opinion, express preference, interact, more actively, it is an opportunity to do that. We are seeing that with the pandemic. You know how much uh, governments have been, uh, 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 um, you know, have been expected and have had to react to not only to make sure that the civil servants can work remotely like everybody else. Uh, that's one case, but also to provide services uh, through digital means uh, more effectively mm -hmm. to provide e-health services. That's another. Uh, uh, area that is so topical now, and that has required uh, a lot of adaptation and transformation within government. So it's not only one tends to think of the digital transformation as something for the private sector for firms, uh, but there is a huge opportunity also for governments uh, to do more uh, on that front. And going back to the behavioral changes that this crisis is, uh, is catalyzing again, there will be an expectation on the part of society that um, um, employers uh, will be much more sympathetic to remote working, uh, that uh, working relations will change within uh, office, within firms, within production lines and so on. Uh, and that the way we interact with each other and with government will also change a more permanent basis on a, on a more permanent basis. So, so I think part of this uh, uh, idea of anticipating permanent changes and reacting to it uh, will be a better understanding uh, of these changing expectations and how we can all adapt to that. I think that's the point, uh, uh, Ricardo. If I can uh, uh, go back to the point that you made, I think that ties in well with, uh, with this aspect of uh, of uh, of improving our preparedness on the basis of understanding needs that are changing fundamentally right now. Yes, and I, I think I can bring that point to PIM as well, to, to extend it, like, I mean, just not just how governments would react, like, you know, at, at a national perspective, but 
how Europe is positioned uh, with respect to China, the US and other major powers in, in, in leveraging the role of technology and in R&D spending in, in relation to this, the recovery after uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Him. Well, thank you, Ray. Um, and just to also second what Louise was saying, I think these behavioral changes we've seen and the role of technology there, these changes will be really, I think, important as we move forward. Uh, it certainly triggered a lot of debate about uh, the sharing of data, access to data, flow of data, when we track uh, the development of, of uh, the spread of the disease and so forth. So it does also expose the policy gaps that we have uh, in dealing with these new technologies. And that's uh, a big part of what we're doing at the World Economic Forum is, is also looking at this fourth industrial revolution that we call it, uh, how governments and, and uh, public sector actors can better respond from a policy perspective uh, and also use these technologies. But uh, coming back to R&D, yes, I think it's true. And somebody was, was saying the other day that what we need to respond to this crisis is innovation, innovation, innovation. Um, I think uh, if we look at the R&D spending, we're still, uh, as a continent, uh, lagging behind both uh, US and China. Uh, and it was therefore encouraging also to see that this new uh, EU recovery package proposes um, an additional 94 billion to research and innovation uh, that will be allocated to the Horizon EU program as part of the budget. So that is encouraging, uh, but we still are not where Europe needs to be globally uh, on innovation and on R&D. And I think um, this crisis and the need for better foresight, better analysis uh, has just heightened uh, the need uh, to, to step up here. Thanks very much, Pim. Yes, and I, I, a few things have come in in terms of re in relation to uh, the chat uh, and some questions have come in, um, which luckily for us, because of our background, relates to uh, sort of standardization and regulation and legislation certification um, and how that can help in, in COVID-19 times. And uh, luckily, we have lots of, of, of experts that can take a view on that on, on the panel. So I'll, I'll actually go around on each each person individually, um, and maybe starting with Sylvia uh, from DG Ross perspective and, and, and standardization being being our, our, our area. Uh, how can standardization help in, in relation to uh, um, dealing with COVID-19? Well, rather than standardization, I would rather uh, talk about quality infrastructure. So the whole system that goes from standards to conformity assessment, uh, to compliance with regulation and all that. And I think that, uh, as you know, the European model is based on trust, is based on the, on the responsibility of the manufacturer and is based on market surveillance. So if you take these three elements, um, especially standardization has uh, in Europe a very special uh, framework, which is a public-private partnership between the European Commission and the, standard, the European standardization body, Sensen and Etsy. And I must say that during this pandemic, this uh, public partner, uh, public uh, private partnership has worked incredibly well because uh, um, sometimes it was even the European standardization body coming forward with some proposal that would help uh, manufacturers or the single market and in the end also the consumers. And um, on the other hand, uh, also conformity assessment had to sort of review their way of uh, of acting and uh, trying to simplify where it was possible the conformity assessment on of uh, some uh, uh, particularly relevant uh, personal protective equipment or medical devices coming from third countries that maybe had not yet completed the, the conformity assessment procedure, but that were, uh, let's say, safe enough to circulate anyway and to put to be put anyway in circulation on the single market. And last but not least, market surveillance obviously had also a very much increased role in checking what was in the European market and uh, in blocking whatever was not uh, deemed to be uh, to be safe enough. And you heard on the news everywhere in almost every member states that sometimes uh, masks or respirators coming from third countries uh, were actually blocked because they were not uh, safe enough to be put in circulation. Thanks, Sylvia. And I just let Lorenzo come in at that same point because uh, because of the standardization link as well, Lorenzo. Yes, thank you. And I would like to bring in a, a particular aspect of uh, PPE uh, that since uh, Sylvia has already started to discuss that. 
And uh, it is an aspect that may be overlooked, but I think uh, it's worth uh, uh, mentioning that uh, uh, as the pandemic unfolded, we also became aware that uh, uh, the standard has uh, a really gendered impact and it impacts upon men and women differently. And even as we look at PPE, at this uh, personal protective equipment that has been so much on the news uh, in, uh, in recent weeks, uh, the vast majority of uh, uh, workers in the health sector are women. And according to data from uh, WHO, there's about 70% of uh, health workers that are women. And at the same time, the PPE that is being made available in hospitals, in home care, in uh, care homes, it, it has been shown not to be uh, perfectly adapted to the women morphology. So that, for example, masks and shields uh, may not be uh, fitting to the um, faces of women. And that can result in uh, an increased risk of contamination. Gowns may be too big and that may result in, in uh, personnel tripping. This is not exclusively a problem for um, the health sector. It's a problem in many other sectors, but clearly with the pandemic, the specifics of the health sector came very much into prominence. Now, uh, what effect is this having on women worker? Probably the data is not there yet. Uh, we found one statistic that uh, infections uh, among uh, women health workers were uh, higher than men in Spain. And according to data, 29 versus 11% of uh, workers uh, were infected. And uh, so uh, I think this, uh, uh, while the data comes in and, and maybe further uh, data is, is certainly needed actually, Still, we need to, to, to take this as a wake up call and really start looking at uh, the standards from a gender perspective. And this is what we've been doing since 2016 at UNECE with a diverse group of stakeholders. And indeed, Silvia and Ray are, are uh, very much a part of that, uh, where we're looking at integrating a gender lens in uh, standards development and also strengthening the use of standards as tool for the achievement of SDG 5 and gender equality. So uh, a little more than uh, uh, a year ago, uh, we uh, signed a declaration uh, and on the opening day, the declaration already had 55 signatories and they, they grew to be almost 70 today with all kinds of standards bodies, international like ISO, like ITU, like IEC, uh, regional like Sense and Elec, like ARSO, but also uh, voluntary sustainability standards like Fair Trade, Rainforest Alliance, uh, the Responsible Jewelry Council, uh, Gold Standard, and, and many, many more. And again, uh, if we look at standards from the perspective of women in all these sectors, we will find that women, again, uh, through the pandemic have been uh, more exposed as they're most often in, uh, uh, informal, uh, in, in the informal uh, sector. So once more, these standards and particularly the voluntary sustainability standards will be so much important to really ensure that women are not left behind in the policies that we put in place for the recovery and uh, to bounce back from the crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lorenza. Um, because the, a lot of these questions were related to standardization, one of them came in from our colleague and friend, Henk de Vries. And I see Henk is actually online at the moment. So Henk, hopefully some of your uh, questions have been answered there, um, uh, but, but uh, maybe you can make a, a, a comment on that. Yes, sir. thank you very much. Um, Yes, indeed, I, I see the importance of standardization and indeed of the entire quality infrastructure. So in particular conformity assessment as well. I think there are quite some standardization aspects that might be added, not only related to the protective devices and to the medical sector, but also to industry, how to be prepared for this crisis. And here we see some initiatives from standards bodies, for instance, to make horizontal standards for, for instance, air quality or offices, how to be, how to do this in the Corona time with where we have social distancing and we, the virus may spread virus the air. 
We also see initiatives in industry sectors to, to take the proper measures. So governments ask something, obliges something, but then it's up to sectors to be prepared. In fact, this is standardization as well, but not by standards bodies, but by industry sectors. Okay. It's interesting to see how they do this and if and this could be done in a better way. It's a kind of new approach, combination of, of government and private sector, sometimes also trade unions involved. How is this being done and could it be done in a better way? So I see... I think luckily enough for us, we're, 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 a lot of the people who are, are joining in and also on the panel have a, have a lot of standardization uh, background and are working actively in that area. So hopefully we will be able to address those questions um, in, in the coming time. I'm conscious now that we've actually run over time, which is, I, I knew this was going to happen. I have a, a list of questions <laughs> coming in on, 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 on live from, from YouTube at the moment and also on the, the channels uh, directed to me on uh, um, uh, Zoom. But unfortunately, we won't have time to take any more of them because I want to give an opportunity to each of our guests just to have just to wrap up with, with a statement um, related to uh, um, uh, COVID-19 and, and, and the pandemic and, and how as a, as a resilient ecosystem and a, a European economy um, as citizens, um, we have been um, coping. Uh, so just, just maybe a very short one-liner from, from, uh, from each of you. And I'll start with uh, from just basically from the screens, Lorenza, if you want to just make a, a, a brief closing statement. Uh, yes, my, my final closing statement is that uh, Europe, uh, as uh, was said, is a regulatory superpower. It is also a donor superpower. And uh, it is absolutely essential right now that Europe keeps on giving to, uh, to its neighborhood, to the world at large. Uh, we need support. Uh, the world needs support in, in terms of continuing to develop uh, the Agenda 2030 to continue to strive to achieve the SDGs and to overcome the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Lorenzo. And Sylvia, uh, as you're next on, on the list, can you um, give your closing statement, please? Yes, I would uh, really like to promise what Lorenzo has asked, but I'm afraid it's well above my pay grade. So <laughs> I will, <laughs> I will just uh, say that yes, uh, definitely Europe is really moving in the right directions, and uh, I really hope to see that in the in the near future uh, some actions will be taken, not only for member states but also for the neighbourhood and in the end for the world. And I must say that during this lockdown period, we have continued with all our FTA negotiation with countries around the world, uh, waking up at seven o'clock to, uh, to, to have negotiation with Australia and, uh, and things like that because of the difference in time. So the, the European Union has not stopped. The European Commission has not stopped. And, uh, and I hope that that will, uh, will have some concrete uh, good consequences for the future. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, next on my list actually is Ricardo. Ricardo, your closing statement. There we go. I got a glitch there. Well, thank you very much. I mean, I thought I think this discussion was really interesting. And you will, Paula. I mean, normally I like to always to end in a positive uh, sort of and high spirited note. But because I see so much groupthink here now, I just want to provoke a little bit sort of reflection as we as we take away from from here. Because I mean, we all work in uh, collaborative, multilateral settings, right? So this is our bread and butter. This is our atmosphere, our environment, our bubble, so to say. But I think there are key uncertainties just from the discussion that I just heard for the past 10 minutes that we need sort of to think about. First, you know, is the world going to become more multilateral and collaborative or is it actually going to be more self-reliant, fragmented? I mean, what type of world are we going to have? And also then on, as Pim mentioned, the innovation. I mean, are, is this, are the solutions for, for this crisis, are, are, are we going to be more innovative? In fact, are the, are the agendas, the policy agendas going to be more innovative? Or rather, are we going to actually, because the crisis is so hard on us, that we're going to go back a little bit to things, you know, back, you know, business as usual and not being able to take really the decisions that we do. So I think these are two key uncertainties that we need to keep in mind in going forward and not just assume that, I mean, multilateralism and all the good things that all our organizations do, that they will be able to do it because, I mean, the out there it's challenging, but I just only do this to even increase more our motivation to, to fight for these things because there are good things and it's the only way for us to get out of this crisis. Thank you, Ricardo. Thank, Thank you. you. So my list is Luis, uh, Luis de Mello. Your closing statement, please, Luis. Thanks, Ray. I think there are two adjectives that come to mind when we think of COVID-19. 
One, it, it's, uh, this crisis is dramatic, dramatic because of the human loss, the economic loss that is still going on. So uh, this, we, we should never lose track of that. And the other objective is that it's very exciting times. Exciting times because it's, a, it's an opportunity of a lifetime for us to learn from what we are doing. Uh, who would imagine three months ago that we would have, we'll be having a conversation that we are having today. Um, to identify what has worked and uh, the, the errors that we have made. Uh, and to make sure that then the, by identifying good practices, learning from experience, uh, putting our minds together, we make sure that we will be better off next time to face a shock of this magnitude, which I hope we will not face in our lifetime anyway. Thank you very much, Luis. And last but not least, you opened um, the, the talk for us, Pim, and your takeaway message, please. Well, thank you. I mean, from the World Economic Forum, I think we will continue to do our part to mobilize uh, the business and the private sector to help us pull through uh, the recovery and to make sure that we don't spend all of this uh, fiscal stimulus into old and outdated models. We really need to move forward. Uh, again, innovation, innovation, innovation. Uh, and uh, we cannot do this institutions and governments alone, uh, we do need to work uh, with the private sector and the industry on this. Thank you, Pim. And last but not least, I just have to close off this um, session. I mean, it's, it's been brilliant. I want to thank each and every one of you individually. Uh, you've made my job very, very easy. The, the flow of the conversation was, was brilliant. Uh, the type of questions that we've had to, to address. Unfortunately, there is a list of them as long as your arm, which we won't, won't be able to get to. Um, uh, thanks, Pim. And we'll, uh, we will resume with conversation you on, on our second, our second um, uh, I suppose, outing um, in the next couple of months, and hopefully we'll be able to, to get more people involved again um, of the calibre of the expert panel that we've managed to put together today. So thanks very much, Pim. Thanks, Sylvia. Thanks, Ricardo. Thanks, Louise. Thanks to everybody that, that's, that Olga who at the start, uh, Sylvia, um, everybody who's, who's, who's come in, Hank for, for, for doing the live question there as well, for the people who contributed on on um, YouTube and for the people who come in in the audience on Zoom. Thank you very much. And hopefully we'll see you all again soon. So be safe and be well. Take care. Thank you. Bye bye. Goodbye. Thank you.